So today we are taking a look at a very old, over 100 years Masonic book that shows that or says that religion is fake. Now, we started this book uh, last week. And so last week, when we started this book, we took a look how this book revealed a secret version of Christianity. Now, today, we're going to be taking a look at how it says that essentially religion is fake. And we're even going to be getting into the secret doctrine of the Freemasons. If you haven't seen last week's video, uh, you should watch it. I will put a link to the playlist at the end of this video. If you haven't seen that one yet, uh, though, don't worry about it. You don't need to have seen it to understand this video, but there is going to be a whole playlist on this book and everything in this book. It's uh, an extremely interesting book. And so make sure you check out the playlist if you want to know more info on that. Also, please like and subscribe. You're not going to find information uh, anywhere else than here. So like and subscribe. It helps out a lot. And let's get started. So we're going to be taking a look here at this book, which is called Mystic Masonry. And we read chapter four, The Secret Doctrine. So this is a quote. The true Mason is a practical philosopher who, under religious emblems in all ages, adopted by wisdom, builds upon plans traced by nature and reason, the moral edifice of knowledge. And this comes from the Masonic book called Morals and Dogma, that quote. Um, and I also always want to uh, emphasize that I am coming to this uh, from the Hyperion perspective. So I want to remind you that uh, Hyperionism is not any kind of secret society or anything like that. We are about spreading knowledge and spreading information. But today we are taking a look at specifically what this book on Freemasonry says. So I just want to make it clear. We're reading what this book says. This, These are not what this book says is, is not my position. I am not advocating for Freemasonry or anything or speaking for it or anything like that. We're just reading this book and seeing what it has to say. And I'll be making commentary from the Hyperion perspective. So among all the ancient nations, there was one faith and one idea of deity for the enlightened. This is important. I'm going to read that again because it's important. Among all the ancient nations, there was one faith and one idea of deity or God for the enlightened, intelligent, and educated, and another for the common people. So basically what this is saying is that there's two versions. There's basically the truth, one idea of what the deity is really is, that is reserved for the intelligent and the educated. And then a different story is given to um, basically the masses. And we talked about this last week when we looked at the exoteric version of Christianity that everyone is familiar with, and then the secret version of Christianity that was reserved for initiates that had secret information that was um, given to people by degrees. And we had all those different quotes by bishops talking about this, saying how it was true. So um, that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're sort of continuing by showing, um, this is what this quote is saying, is that there was one idea for the intelligent and the educated and a different version for the common people. So to this rule, the Hebrews were no exception. It, as in Freemasonry, is philosophical because it teaches the great truths concerning the nature and existence of one supreme deity and the existence and immortality of the soul. The universe, which is the uttered word of God, is infinite in extent. There is no empty space beyond creation on any side. The universe, which is the thought of God pronounced, never was not God, uh, never, never was not, since God never was inert. So what I think that I'm going to do is... I'm going to explain to you the Hyperion perspective here, because what I want to really emphasize, again, so Freemasonry is a lot about hiding things in symbolism, hiding things in, in, in uh, like parables and all that. And uh, it's, I want to give you, I want to show you like, like the, the power of Hyperionism and how it goes beyond any of this sort of thing. Because I'm always, you know, people always ask me about like secret societies or the occult or the esoteric or esoterica or Thelema or Ordo Templi Orientis or the Rosicrucians or the uh, Theosophical Society or like, and I'm just saying, look, you won't find anything in these places that you won't find in Hyperionism except way more 
developed, incredibly more developed. And so let me just kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. So when we look at this where it says, um, so uh, it teaches the truths concerning the nature and existence of one supreme deity and the existence and the immortality of the soul. The universe, which is the uttered word of God, is infinite in extent. There is no empty space beyond creation on any side. The universe, which is the thought of God pronounced, never was not since God never was inert. Um, so one can, you know, this is very like esoteric and mystical and all that, but here's what's going on. So, um, one supreme deity and the existence and the immortality of the soul. So we know that as the absolute, and we know this, that this is a mathematical reality and the soul is eternal by virtue of being a system of mathematical sinusoids and being that it is a system of mathematical sinusoids, it is a necessary existence because math mathematics itself is a living system that is logically necessary. So this supreme being, this one deity, it's what we are. We are a collective of monadic minds, which is a collective of uh, monadic frequency patterns, and this forms one system, which is uh, the absolute. Now, when it says the universe, which is the uttered word of God, is infinite in extent, there is no empty space beyond creation on any side. Basically, what this means is the universe, which is the uttered word of God, what does this mean? It means that the universe is the creation of information. Word represents information. What, that when it says the uttered word of God, that means in, you know, like esoteric lingo, information. So this information is mathematical information. So by saying the universe, the universe is the uttered word of God, what's really going on here is that the universe is the space-time representation of our interacting internal frequency information. So our us as mathematical minds are beings of basically mathematical data. And being that word of God or the logos, right? Logos is often, logos means word, but it's also used for reason. So this is kind of like the primitive way of talking about code, coding, like logos, the word, the reason. Um, you have us as mathematical minds that are, you know, a code, living code, that through our interaction give rise to the space-time universe, because what we are are sinusoidal waves that when they interact and have uh, non-orthogonal phase relations, via Fourier mathematics, this results in a space and time projection. It's sort of like a hologram in a certain way, but it's an internal hologram. It's not an external hologram. It's more like an internal dream, but it's a collective dream, which means it's stable and persistent, like uh, a computer code that gives rise to a game or something like that. It's stable and consistent. So the uttered word of God, which created the universe, is us as eternal monadic minds through our internal frequency interactions, the mathematical data, word of God, gives rise to the space-time universe. And the universe, which is the thought of God pronounced, and again, the thought of God pronounced, we as monadic minds, the sinusoidal waves, the mathematics that makes us up, those are thoughts. The thought of God pronounced essentially means the space-time projection, the representation of thought. That's what that means. So you have the representation of thought pronounced. Now, what, I, what I'm talking about right now, I'm not saying that Freemasons believe what I am saying. I am saying that through this sort of mystical... Uh, wording and 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 what one is trying to get at can be clarified infinitely better through hyperionism and ontological mathematics and our system of knowledge than anywhere that you're going to get in you know like esoterica or the occult and all that like do you want these mystical ideas about oh the word of god was uttered and gave rise to the universe and or do you actually want to know the rational explanations to how this could be based on logic and reason and first principles and mathematics and the source formula and giving rise via Fourier mathematics and space-time projections dealing with wave interference and all like it's it's I hopefully hopefully you get what I mean right so anyway we're we're just going to continue here I myself was never not nor thou nor all the princes of the earth nor shall we ever hereafter cease to be Again, this is true. Basically, they're saying that they're eternal. And yes, we as eternal minds are eternal. We, I, you, all of us will never cease to be. This is because we logically must exist. We can't not exist because we are systems of mathematical information. And I'm not going to get, I've done so many different videos on this, but basically what happens if you take all the mathematical data 
the resultant is zero. That's because if you take all positive numbers and all negative numbers, well, what do you get? If you have a complete and consistent set of mathematics with all possible positive values and all positive negative values, this resolves and nets to zero, which means that ultimately we as a system of mathematics are zero, which mathematically is nothingness. And logically and rationally, nothingness can exist and must exist. And it can't ever cease to exist because nothing, you can never prevent its existence because it doesn't require anything. And you can never snuff out its existence because it is nothing. Nothing isn't something you can create or destroy. It logically must be. And so the concept of zero and the concept of nothing is at the same time the concept of everything because nothing contains within it everything as long as that everything is balanced between positive and negative, which mathematics provides that balance and sinusoidal waves themselves, which are uh, dependent on Euler's formula, which we call the source formula and Hyperionism also nets to zero. Its resultant is zero. So waveforms, sinusoids are net zero across one um, cycle. So everything, uh, everything emanates from a single principle and a primitive love, which is the moving power of all and governs all. So everything does emanate from a single principle. This is the principle of sufficient reason. This is reason itself that governs everything. Um, it is not love. Love is not uh, what, and, and so this is, uh, it is a moving power of all and it is that which governs all. But it is not love. It is reason. So here's the thing. People often think that reality is, is powered by love. Reality isn't powered by love. It's powered by reason. Love is a beautiful thing. Love is an important thing. Love is a power, powerful thing. But it is not the ultimate principle of reality. Reason is the ultimate principle of reality. So if you want to incorporate love, you also have to incorporate hate because you need those opposites. You can't have one without the other. You have love and hate, you have up and down, you have left and right, you have hot and cold. So um, reality goes through cycles and some of these cycles can dominate, be dominated by hate and some of these cycles can be dominated by love. And I really shouldn't say, I don't mean universal cycles for those who are familiar with Hyperionism, but the um, periods within cycles, uh, some are dominated by hate, some are dominated by love, but it's not the ultimate governing principle. The ultimate governing principle is mathematics, which can express itself as love. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. And we want a world of love. We want to create a, a beautiful world where it's possible to have uh, an abundance of love. We want that. But it is um, mathematics as living mathematics that can express itself as love. That's one mode, one form that it can express itself as. You can think of it sort of like a unifying function. Mathematics can express itself as a unifying function, which can be experienced as love. But there's also a dividing function. Hate is a dividing and separating function. And so you have these different functions within uh, the system itself. So masonry teaches and has preserved in its purity the cardinal tenets of the old primitive faith, which underlie and are the foundations of all religion. So they're saying that, hey, you have all these different religions. What masonry does is it teaches you the foundation that all these religions are built on. That's what they're saying. So there is in no fact in history more easily and completely demonstrable than the existence of the secret doctrine in all ages among all people and of ad adepts or masters who are familiar with its teachings and were more or less capable of expounding its principles. So basically they're saying there's this super secret, um, you know, founding idea that all other ideas, all other religions are based on. It is equally demonstrable that the secret doctrine was the real foundation of every great religion known to man, just said this, so that only the initiated priest or hierophant knew the real doctrine in any case, and only these as a rule in the earliest history of each religion. And once again, difference between Hyperionism and secret societies and, and mystery schools and all that is that we aren't about uh, like giving the public one version and then like having a secret version for the initiates or something like that. We aren't a secret society. We don't do things like that. We're not a mystery school. We are like a university. So we want you to understand everything that we have to offer. We want to give you the tools to come to self-knowledge. We want to give you the tools to raise your consciousness ultimately reaching hyper awareness is the ultimate goal that hyperionism wants you to achieve is to reach hyper awareness so it's not about you know hiding information for the initiates or anything like that it's about like here we want to give you this information so that you can uh, apply that to your life raise in consciousness and and continue to learn and understand so um Furthermore, the sacred books okay so here 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 we have this area where we're talking about what religion is. 
And so we're having the author who says, furthermore, the sacred books of all religions, including those of the Jews and Christians, were and are no more than parables and allegories of the real secret doctrine transcribed for the ignorant and superstitious masses. So here you go. This Masonic book is telling you essentially that mainstream religion is fake. It's false. According to this book, that all the books of all religions, including the books of the Jews, including the books of the Christians, all they are are parables and allegories for a real hidden secret that were given to the ignorant and superstitious masses. So they're basically saying that religion is like a front for the real uh, information, that it's a, a, a facade. It is the version given to the masses that is in parables and stories, whereas the real version uh, you know, the, the, is, is hidden behind that. That is what this book is saying with regard to religion. All commentaries written in these sacred books, whether on those of Moses, the Psalms, the prophets of Judaism, the gospels of the Gnostics and Christians, or those written on the sacred books of the East, the Vedas, uh, Puranas, and the Upanishads, all either make confusion more confounded when written by one ignorant of the secret doctrine or when written by initiates but ring the changes on or further elaborate elaborate the parables and allegories. So basically what he's saying is all these secret books are either written by the ignorant and so do not reflect truth or they're written by initiates who are speaking in parables and allegories in secrets, not outright saying the truth, but giving a hidden version. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not a fan of this way of doing things. Uh, I'm, I, I, people, uh, you know, this whole idea of, well, people, people can't handle the truth. We're just going to give them stories and parables. No, I'm for teaching and educating, not, uh, hiding and being like, well, if you, if you can, if you can understand this, maybe we'll tell you the real secrets. Did you, did you, did you get that? No, 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 none of that. So, uh, it is further easily demonstrable that the secret doctrine uh, came originally from the Far East and is the primitive wisdom religion. Its earlier records are now found in India and Tibet. Thence, it seems to have traveled to Ethiopia, thence to Egypt and Chaldea. This route or order of transmission, however, is not to be easily ascertained with accuracy, nor is it a matter of any consequence to us at the present time. It is everywhere and at all times essentially the same, only the outer gloss, the parables and allegories concealing it differ among different people. So again, what they're saying is that there's this, you know, secret doctrine and uh, that, that basically always remains the same and all these different religions are... Uh, obscured parable myths and symbols that 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 have either been distorted by the ignorant or purposefully written in allegorical form by initiates. So underlying this secret doctrine was a profound philosophy of the creation or evolution of worlds and of man. Okay, so they're saying that what what is the secret doctrine? It's a profound ph philosophy about the creation or evolution of worlds and of man. The present humanity in many quarters of the globe has evolved on the intellectual plane so far that there now exists a very large number of persons capable of apprehending this old philosophy and at the same time capable of understanding the responsibility incurred in misusing or misinterpreting it. A large number of persons have reached on the intellectual plane the state of manhood and are capable, by the way, I don't like all this, um, gendered, uh, phrasing, just, just, just throwing that out there. I'm, I'm reading this as how it is, but I'm not a fan of, you know, putting things in terms of man and manhood and brotherhood and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, continuing on, uh, a large number of persons have reached out on the, uh, intellectual plane, the state of manhood and are capable of partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and, and so what essentially this means is that humanity is reaching a stage when they are intellectually proficient enough to understand this secret doctrine, partake of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And we can understand this as an allegory of um, stepping outside of a primitive consciousness. 
right? You have the fruit of knowledge of, of, of good and evil. This was off limits. God made this off limits. And um, the serpent, or archetypally Lucifer, the light bearer, the wisdom bringer, the one who wants you to look within and become divine, offers the fruit of knowledge so that one may look within and, as the serpent said, be like God, because one when look one when one looks within and knows thyself and understands what they are, you will understand that you are an eternal divinity in that you are the creator of this world, as we all are. We are the mathematical beings that gave rise to this world. And we when we understand what that is, we will be like God. Because we are God, and there is no God but us. Uh, so there is therefore no reason why this old philosophy should be longer concealed. And I agree with this. I, it, it shouldn't, it, it should be told to everyone. On the other hand, there are reasons why it should be known. Empirical knowledge has advanced in certain directions into the realm of psychism and the arts anciently designated by the term magic and it's imperative and it is imperative that the dangers that attend these pursuits should be pointed out and demonstrated in order that they may be avoided by uh, uh, the beneficent and that the ignorant or innocent may be afforded protection. How far these major or these modern inroads into occultism or ancient magic extend, very few persons seem to realize. It is therefore high time that the philosophy of the East should illuminate the science of the West and thus give the death blow to that intellectual uh, diabol diabolism, diabolism, how do you, diabolism, and spiritual nihilism known as materialism. So many isms. So yes, of course, nihilism is being that the world is meaningless, which also often goes in hand in hand with materialism, which is the belief that... Um, Reality is material and only material. So I, I agree uh, to some. So, you know, when talking about magic and whatnot, they're basically saying that modern um, ideas are, are, are extending into this territory, which it depends how one defines magic. And if one understands magic as being a form of psychology, then, yes, um, one can say that 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 is true. Uh, but one has to be very, very careful here because when one pe when people start talking about magic, they start to go a little crazy. They don't really understand what they're talking about. They start believing in wild ideas and reaching five dimensional planes and speaking to the transcendent um, ascended masters and the secret chiefs and all this sort of thing. It starts to get real crazy real fast. So one has to be real careful again, always in esoterica and occultism, uh, and make sure one is guided by logic and reason. Um, but yes, th there should be a, be a death blow given to nihil spiritual nihilism and materialism, 100%. So materialism is the belief that reality is matter and only matter. This is a ridiculously primitive idea. It's so illogical, so fallacious. It has been, um, time and time again, refuted to death. It's, it's a logical impossibility. So th this is absolutely true. This is, um... Uh, the, 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 you know, the truth is that matter is uh, what you, you could consider matter to be an illusion because matter usually is typically defined as that which is mind independent. Matter is not mind independent. It is mind dependent because we gave rise to this reality through our uh, the interactions of our mathematical frequency uh, via Fourier mathematics. It gives rise to this. So Essentially, what that means is that reality in a certain way is a mathematically generated, persistent and stable dream. It's uh, persistent and stable because we as a collective contribute to it. Every single mind in existence, which is an enormously high uh, number. Now, when you go to sleep and dream at night, you're in a world that is created and generated by just you yourself. So it can change. It's unstable. It's not persistent. It's constantly changing according to you and your emotions and, and, and what you're thinking about. This world doesn't do that because it's not made up of just your frequency contribution. It's um, composed of the frequency contribution of all of us together. And so this is not a material reality. It's a mathematical dream that is persistent and stable because it is a collective product. Uh, 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 so grave responsibility, however is incurred by such a revelation. Okay, so they're basically saying we got to get rid of materialism and spiritual nihilism. I agree 100%. And, and this is only the secret doctrine, and only this the secret doctrine can accomplish. Um, and the problem that I have with this is this whole idea about the secret doctrine, it really puts the focus in the wrong way, right? Because you talk about, oh, well, there's this secret first, you know, super secret religion that has the real truth and all religions were built on it. And this is what can you know, bring us to a new, a new level of awareness and all that. 
And, um, you know, again, I'm talking about in the lens of Hyperionism. If, if you are involved in Freemasonry or the cult or the esoterica or whatever, that's fine. That's awesome. Um, you do you. That's totally, totally fine. Uh, I'm just talking about, from my perspective, and a lot of people who follow me on this channel are Hyperion, so I'm giving the Hyperion perspective. Looking to the past is not the way to go. Looking that the, the direction is, is, is put in the wrong area. If one is searching through ancient books and in hidden glyphs and different formulas trying to find and put together the secret doctrine. Now, you're going to find the answer in the future and going forward in uh, reaching a higher consciousness through metacognition, concept networking, understanding how reality operates, using our systems of ontological mathematics, interstar actualization to uncover what reality is and step into a higher consciousness. You're not going to, you're not going to find some secret book written, you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago or whatever that's going to that's gonna have some secret tidbit that's just going to automatically make you go, wow, I finally figured it out. Evolution is about going forward, evolving, transforming, learning, discovering. It's not about going backwards, trying to dig through old texts. I mean, what would you find? Like, ima imagine you found it. Imagine you found this, this, the, the scroll that was the secret doctrine and you opened it up. What would it say if it was supposed to have the secret you know, knowledge of, of all existence, what's it going to say? What what big revelation is it going to be? If it's something that truly reveals what reality is, it would be um, something in terms of, that would be incredibly complex, that would require mathematical complexities that we don't, it would be basically in a mathematical language that we would have to evolve to be able to understand anyway. You're not going to find some something in that, that that's going to magically just imbue you with knowledge this the whole point that we are here is to evolve and learn we're here to understand what we are where we are why we are here and this entails evolving this entails reaching higher levels of consciousness this entails um you know like and, and again hyperionism is all about giving you the tools to do this so this is through ontological mathematics, inner star actualization. It's through our um, aims for the creation of a new world. It's the aims for understanding triadic consciousness, which has the monadic perspective, the avatar perspective, the absolute, all these different tools that are given to you um, to help you evolve. You, you're not here on like some, you're, you're here to grow, learn, and evolve. You're not here to root through thousand-year-old books looking for some super secret hidden knowledge. That's not knowing thyself. You see what it, don't externalize. Don't go looking for something. It's if you are looking for something outside of you, you're not looking at the right place. Everything is is here. It's in you. Know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. It's all within. So if you're looking somewhere externally, that's that's not the case. Now, it could be argued, it could be argued that masons agree and they're using this as a parable. Um, and, and sure, whatever, that's fine. Again, I don't like hiding things in parables and symbols and stories and being like, well, if they really were smart, they wouldn't go looking externally. They would know the secret doctrine is inside. Well, then just say that, you know, come on. Um, <laughs> look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be disparaging here. Uh, I, again, I'm giving the Hyperion perspective and I am very passionate about people gaining knowledge and being able to reach a new consciousness because we live in a shit world because people aren't given the tools that they need to reach a new consciousness. They're distracted all every. They're distracted by TV. They're distracted by work. They're distracted by um, social events. They're dis distracted by celebrity gossip and TikTok and all, all that shit. It's all a distraction so that you're not understanding where you are, what you are, and why you were here. So that you can't take a fucking goddamn second to go, wow, this is all really weird. Where am I? What is this place? What is any of this? No, people don't do that because they're too busy watching some dumb TikTok uh, dance or some bullshit. Like, so they're coming. So anyway, I I don't like this. People are already distracted and 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 mired in this cage of of sleep and dreams that they have woven, uh, as per Gustave Marink would say and yeah I, I i don't want to make it any more difficult than it already is so anyway uh let's continue here
so there's a grave responsibility. Um, and that's my smoke alarm. Um, there's a grave responsibility, however, is incurred by such a revelation. Those who, like the professional hypnotists and vivisectionists, have sinned, perhaps ignorantly, and thus have been unconsciously black magicians, will eventually find no avenue of escape. All right. So the, here, here's here's interesting. Here's something interesting. Basically, what they're saying is that people like hypnotists, and and I don't agree with this. I, who, Buck, who wrote this book, misunderstood hypnotism, but we'll get to that in a minute. But basically, what it's saying, there are people out there who are misusing this information without knowing it, because that's kind of his point. He's saying things like, "Hey, hypnotism and psychology and all this, this is getting into the realm of magic, but people don't know that they're using magic, and so that they don't know it, they're not using it properly, and they're becoming black magicians." Uh, I, you know, I could go on and on about that, but. What I want to point out here is the idea of of be, of being a black magician. Um, so you have this idea of of uh, like black magicians and and and, and white magicians um, do, doing like white magic and black magic, right? And first of all, if you go, every so many different schools of thought give a different uh, definition of what black magic and white magic is depending on what system you look at, they'll have a different different definition for it. But in general, the common idea, well, this isn't even the common idea, but this is along with, it would take me too long to, to get into the whole story behind it. But basically, here's the thing. Black magicians are and black magic is usually associated with like left-hand path and then right-hand path. And, and again, as much as black magicians, black magic and white magic is, is debated, uh, left hand path and right hand path is is often debated, um, and so okay. <laughs> the reason why I'm saying this is because I know someone in the comments who's part of something is going to go, well, you know, that's not actually left hand path. You're talking about the black school of magic, and did you account for the yellow school? And like, I know there's a bunch of different ways, but I'm I'm trying to keep this condensed. So. Usually, right, if we talk about, say, left hand path or black hand or uh, right hand path or black magic or white magic, um, black magic is usually defined as um, manipulating sort of reality for selfish aims, whereas white magic is sort of about uh, aligning one's will with the will of the universe and using uh, ways of, of transforming the world according to kind of like the greater good, the will of the universe, whereas black magic is more selfish. And then you sort of have left hand path, which is because uh, people don't really realize that occult systems and magical systems, it's really about it, it is about evolution. People don't really realize this. Most people today who get involved with like chaos magic or Thelema or, or any of that stuff. The, what I usually see is that they're using it to either try and make money or get dates like they have no idea what the actual thing is about. But um, it's about spiritual evolution, and usually what is associated with left-hand path is individuals who are trying to evolve to become a sort of a singular independent god. Right? So say, say you had several members that were left-hand path members, they, they would all be trying to individually evolve into individual gods, whereas right-hand path is more about achieving union with the divine. So you, you can see th there's a difference. You have you have right hand path, which is about this this unity with the divine, and then left hand path, which is about becoming individual gods. And so if we're talking about terms in, of magic, which I don't like doing, I don't even like associating Hyperionism with magic because it completely. I, so so don't do that. Hyperionism is not a system of magic. Okay, but if we were using that lingo, we would say that it's a combination of both because Hyperionism is about evolving to become self-actualized individual powerful beings which ones could call an individual god but it also is about forming one interconnected system the absolute which is all of us acting as one so it's it's both we are individual gods that form a network that is one mind the absolute which is us so it's not like we're trying to be absorbed into a singular unity where we lose all sense um of of who we are or or whatnot uh, but the it's not where we're all just completely and totally fractured independent separate 
at the same time because we form one network. And so to, instead of talking in terms of magic and all that, it's it's much more helpful to talk in terms of, of like computer science and neural networks. We exist as monadic neural networks. We are individual monadic minds. That's what we are. You could call it a soul, but let's not do that. It's a monadic mind. That's what you are, an eternal system of mathematical data. It is transforming and evolving. And as you optimize, transform, and evolve, you gain more power, and you eventually can reach a, a very powerful level, which would be a godlike level. However, you are also a node in a monadic node of a network, and that network mind is us together as a collective, the absolute. So you can see that, like in terms of magic, we would be neither left-hand path nor right-hand path. We would be uh, synthesized. So we are, you know, in, in Hyperionism, we use the dialectic. We take uh, thesis and antithesis and always create the higher synthesis. Anyway, um, I digress. Basically, the author here is saying, hey, you got hypnotists, you got vivisectionists. Um, and I'm not really sure why he's including vivisectionists, but I can see why he's including hypnotists. And he's saying that they're, uh, they have sinned, perhaps ignorantly, and have unconsciously been black magicians will eventually find no avenue of escape. Ignorance can no longer cover their inhumane and cruel practices. The hypnotist cannot reduce the mind of a trusting but ignorant brother to the condition of imbecility without facing the law that counts such a crime as no less than murder. Uh, so the new, uh, the new science resulting from the union to which I have referred and which I believe Mr. J. M. Rusk proposes to call psychophysics will be well understand before the close of the 20th century and many an old score in the intellectual arena will be settled. Well, I mean, that's not true. <laughs> so unfortunately, it um, the 20th century has ended and uh, materialism is, is still um, rampant. But here's the thing. So he, this guy, so Mr. Buck here has, has a problem with uh, hypnotists and essentially thinking that, you know, hypnotists are black magicians if they use their powers wrong and talking about reducing someone to imbecility. Uh, you, you can't do that with hypnotism. So hi hypnotism is very interesting and it's very powerful. But ultimately you cannot, um, you know, if you've ever seen a stage show and people like hypnotize someone to quack like a duck and all that, that's not. You, you can't make someone do something against their will. It's not like they're suddenly like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I have to quack like a duck. They, they, that, that's not how, how it works. Hypnotism can't make someone do that. It works on the power of suggestion. So if they do that, it means even if it's unconsciously, they ultimately want to do that because it would either be in a, in a, in a, in a, in an actual like, um, sort of twist of like a twist. It would, for some people, it's actually more embarrassing to not quack like a duck because they would just be standing there and nothing would happen. So that's like an unconscious um, impulse. Uh, some people enjoy being the center of attention and others genuinely are suggestible. And so they, 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 but they could never do something against their will. You can't hypnotize someone to say, like if, if the hypnotist on stage gave someone a knife and was like, hey, you're going to go kill that person. That, that you can't do that unless that person was just already just in, incredibly unstable then um but but yeah so so buck here has has misunderstood hypnotism you can't do that now what you can do with hypnotism is you can um you can seed unconscious suggestions you can do that so if so, if someone is in a suggestible state if you've hypnotized them and when you hypnotize someone, basically what you're doing is you're just putting them in a suggestible state, which means they're they're relaxing their conscious firewall, so to speak, so that you can have access to their unconscious mind. So when you're putting someone in a suggestible state, you know, it's kind of like a meditative state and you're doing the same sort of thing. You're relaxing your linear left brain associated functions and you're opening up access to the unconsciousness, to the unconscious. That's what's going on. So. If you if you if you do that with a hypnotist, what they can do is implant unconscious suggestions, and yeah, that that can happen. So if someone, um, you know, this is why there's like, you know, having to do with quitting addiction and stuff like that, um, is related to hypnotism. So you can do that, but again, while you can certainly influence people and implant ideas, you 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 cannot you know, be like, oh, hey, when you hear the word Beethoven, you're going to go kill, um, you know, your neighbor's dog. Like, you can't do that. So, 
uh, anyway, th that's just kind of a little silly. But uh, so they know little of the forces at work or the principles involved to imagine that there is sufficient force in dissolving creeds or in the dying theories of materialism. So greatly retard the progress of these truths by sneers or ridicule or to prevent the triumph of any opposition they can bring to bear against them. They have waited for millenniums and their time has come. So let's see, this is a quote again. Is this by, uh, let's see, to, to recapitulate the secret doctrine. Okay, so I think this is a, probably a quote from Pike, but I'm not sure. The secret doctrine was the universally diffused religion of the ancient and prehistoric world. Proof of its diffusion, authentic records of its history, complete chain of documents showing its character and presence in every land, together with the teaching of all its great adepts, exist to that this day in secret crypts of libraries belonging to the occult fraternity. Well, then just like just like just publish it then. I mean, come on. It's it's all right. As as I would say, don't bother looking anywhere externally. You don't need to be digging through secret texts or trying to reach the highest degree so you'll finally have access to this thing. It's all in here. It's all in here. The danger was this. Doctrines such as the planetary chain or the seven races at once give a clue to the sevenfold nature of man. For each principle is correlated to a plane, a planet, and a race. The human principles are on every plane correlated to the sevenfold occult forces, those of the highest planes being of tremendous power. This is all outdated stuff. Like, it's not, you know, seven was like a big deal. You have like the seven, the seven lights and the 49 lights and um, the, the seven races and, and all this sort of thing. It, this is all, you know, stemming from Theosophy and Blavatsky. And uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's just outdated and, and, um, like, yeah, it's a, just a wild goose chase. So, no one styling himself a scholar in whatever department of exact science will be permitted to regard these teachings. Seriously, uh, they will be derided and rejected a priori in this century, but only in this one. For in the 20th century of our era, scholars will begin to recognize the secret doctrine has neither been invented nor exaggerated, but on the contrary, simply outlined. And finally, that its teachings uh, antedate the Vedas. Well, I mean, so they said this was going to happen in the 20th century, but uh, that didn't happen. So, and in a footnote, it is said, there is no pretension to prophecy but simply a statement based on the knowledge of facts. And again, I just want to point out, I know that I'm sounding disparaging. If, if, you, if you are into the occult or masonry or esoterica or whatever, that's awesome. That's fine. That's great. That's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> this is just, we talk about Hyperionism on this channel, and so I'm giving the Hyperion perspective, which is not a secret society or a hidden system or system of the occult. So of course we're going to have differing our, our views are going to differ or else we'd be the same system. We're not. We're, we're a system of knowledge based on logic and reason um, that looks to the future using cutting edge mathematics, psychology to raise consciousness using metacognition, concept networking, um, all these different tasks so that we can make change right here, right now with as many as people as possible because we live in a shit world and this needs to happen. Like we don't want to deal with, um, you know, making it any harder than it needs to be by hiding it. Uh, so in speaking of the source from which the present version of the secret doctrine is derived, our author says regarding an old book. So very old that our modern antiquarians might ponder over its pages in indefinite time and still not quite agree as to the nature of the fabric upon which it is written. The most ancient Hebrew document of occult learning, the Sephirah, oh, I do not know how to say this, was compiled from it. And that is a time when the former was already considered in the light of a literary, literary relic. The days of Constantine were the last turning point in history, the period of the supreme struggle that ended in the Western world, throttling the old religions in favor of the new ones, but on uh, built on their bodies. So basically the days of Constantine, they're talking about the, the Council of Nicaea, were basically, yeah, and I mean, this is very true. I'm There's good stuff here. I'm not hating on this at all. Um... There's, 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 there's good stuff here. It's just not, it's just not ours. It's just not how we do things. So they're basically talking about how there was higher knowledge and it's true. You're going to find a lot more interesting knowledge in Gnosticism or Hermeticism, um, Neoplatonism, all, all these different things. 
than you are going to in 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 the Bible. Uh, there's there's much more. I mean, this like Gnosticism is it's still all an allegory in parables. They talk about Yaldabaoth trapping you know the divine souls from the pleroma into the you know the the world of matter, and it's it's still a parable and it's still a story, but it's a lot it's a lot better than than the one where Jesus is, dies is on a cross so that you don't have to go to hell. That's kind of a dumb one. So anyway, they're talking about uh, the Nicene Council where uh, Constantine uh, converted to Christianity and he got together a council of 300 bishops because the church was divided. They were all fighting. The particular thing that they were fighting the most about was the status of Jesus, whether Jesus was a man or if he was divine or if he was a spirit or if he was God they were, or if he was a creation of God. And uh, particularly the Bishop Arius had this idea that I think he believed that Jesus was was um, lesser than God, but the most the most perfect of God's creations. I believe that was Arius's position. Anyway, the church was all divided. They were all fighting over. It. They were like, "Well, who is what? What? What exactly is this Jesus guy? Was he God or was he something else?" Um, so the church was divided. Constantine had just unified the empire, and uh, Constantine said that division in the church is worse than war. So Constantine was like, "Hey, I just." You know, I converted to Christianity to unify the empire, and I also unified the empire through war by, um, you know, through war. And 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 now this is not good. People are divided. They're arguing. So he, he gathered this council of 300 bishops and basically said, hey, figure it out. Uh, I, you know, and, and, and so these bishops decided basically what Christianity was. They decided they they. And and so they all decided what Christianity was in their council. And then anyone who disagreed with them, all the texts were burned, all the books were burned, um, destroyed, and anyone who was trying to preserve the books were killed. So you had this, um, all the knowledge that was much superior uh, was destroyed in place of what we have today now, which is basically a system of control. And you had these bishops backed by the power of the empire, uh, the Roman Empire and, and Constantine, and they were able to get very powerful. And you have what we have today as modern day Christianity, more or less. Uh, so, so the days of Constantine were the last turning point in history, the period of the supreme struggle that ended in the Western world, throttling the old religions, the, the ones that were closer to truth, in favor of the new ones what we understand now to be modern-day Christianity, built on their bodies. From thence the vista into the far distant past, beyond the deluge and the Garden of Eden, began to forcibly and relentlessly uh, closed by every fair and unfair means against the indiscreet gaze of posterity. Every issue was blocked up, every record that hands could be laid upon destroyed. And yet, that, that is true. Like I said, lots of Lots of book burning, lots of um, lots of lots of killing. Not good, not good, not good at all. So this same Constantine, who, with his soldiers, and environed the bishops at the first Council of Nicaea, AD 325, and dictated terms to their deliberations, applied for initiation into the mysteries, and was told by the officiating priest that no uh, purgation could free him from the crime of putting his wife to death or from his many perjuries and murders. Every careful and unbiased student of history knows why the secret doctrine has been heard of so little since the days of Constantine. An exoteric religion and belief in a personal God bl blotted it out for self-protection, and yet, oh, irony of history, the very Pentateuch conceals it, and for many a student of Kabbalah, of the coming century, the seals will be broken. So basically, um, they're saying the secret doctrine was blotted out by the belief in an exoteric religion and a personal God. So 
Christianity, that's what they're saying. Christianity is the esoteric religion and the belief in a personal God. And if you did, I explained the difference between esoteric and esoteric religions in the last video. Again, if you haven't seen it, go watch it where we go into more detail on the secret version of Christianity. But basically the exoteric version is that sort of dumbed down false version that's given to the masses. That's just in stories and parables. So they're saying that basically like this fake version, this shell replaced the true core because th this is what was preferred and a belief in a personal God, you know, rather than um, a, a God as, a, as an impersonal force that one is actually a part of. In trying to apprehend an outline, at least, of the secret doctrine, two ideas could be kept constantly in mind, uh, space and consciousness. The former, I'm going to burn down one of these days, uh, the former in relation to all that is either thought or asserted, regarding nature and deity, and the latter in regard to deity, nature, and man. In the last analysis, both space and consciousness elude us. What they are per se, we shall never know. Well, in Hyperionism, we know what space and consciousness are. Uh, we may as well take them as facts in our experience, experience and in analyzing the experience, both consciousness and knowledge will expand. So we know what space and consciousness is. So first of all, it has to be... Um, Consciousness is usually confused with sentience. Sentience is the ability to have uh, uh, qualitative experiences. Like if you feel pain or heat or sadness or cold, you are having a sentient experience. That doesn't necessarily entail consciousness. Sentience is just pure awareness. Consciousness is the awareness that one is aware. It's a higher form of mind, a higher structure of mind. It's awareness that one is aware rather than just awareness. And, um, and, and, it would take way too long to get into all the details of what sentience, consciousness, and space, and time, and all that are. Uh, I've written books on this, but um, essentially this goes all back to the mathematical nature of reality and understand extending the nature of zero and that we exist necessarily and that uh, sentience is imbued within this mathematical structure as the aspect of content. And... Um, Space is just the Fourier transform of these frequency functions, or basically like a projection. It's another way of looking at the data. And this isn't abstract or, or, or um, vague. You can, Fourier transforms are a very important field of mathematics. It's used in everything. Um, electrical engineering, um, data processing, uh, uh, wireless, like basically almost quantum mechanics, almost everything you can think of uses quantum, um, Fourier mathematics, uh, image processing, video process, so many things. And so uh, essentially what you can do, what, what Fourier transforms allow you to do, what it allows you to do is take a certain kind of information and represent it in a different way. Kind of like how you can have water represented as ice. And that's not a perfect analogy. All right. But it's kind of in the right same ballpark. So, um, Space and time are the projections or a different way of um, the different context in which motion as thought occurs. You know what? The, I We need to finish this, and I can tell that this is a thing that if I, I will just talk about for hours. So I'm going to force myself to continue because I want to read this chapter, um, but... Plenty of videos on my channel that talk about this if you want to know more. So we do know what space and consciousness are precisely. Um, what is that which was, is, and will be, whether there is a universe or not, whether there be gods or none, asks the Senzar Catechism. And the answer made is space. No, that's not true. This is not true. Space is contingent. And um, so basically what they're saying is that whether there's a universe or not a universe or gods or none or any of that, um, what, what, uh, what, what it is is space. I, I'm not sure he might disagree with that or not, but, but real quick, the reason why it's not space is because space is a uh, contingent projection of mind. So if you have mind, which are frequency functions and it's in a state that is, um, perfectly symmetrical in that there are no phase relations, what happens then is the space-time projection you get is a singularity, which means it's nothing. What this means is that when mind, we're all mathematical mind, when mind is in perfect 
perfection, perfect harmony. There is no asymmetry at all, total perfection. Space vanishes because the domain of space and time and matter is all about imperfection and division. Things are separate. I am here, you are there, that is over there, and this is, th this is not here. When everything is perfect, there's no longer difference. And so space doesn't, uh, space, the domain of space and time does not exist. Because difference is required for it to exist. This cup exists by virtue of difference. It is different than I. It is shaped differently. It is in this location rather than this location. There is a difference. When there is no difference, which, which is attained in the state of perfect mind, space and time do not exist because space and time require difference. Um, so I think he is agreeing, actually. So the, the saying that space is what is eternal says, now space is not nature, nor is it deity. Space may be said to contain nature or creation and to conceal divinity. It is therefore the point of emanation and the vanishing point. So it seems like they're trying to equate space with the singularity, which is odd because that's precisely what space is. It's not. Space is precisely not the singularity. Um, anyway, I don't know. Certainly don't agree with that. So the occult catechism contains the following questions and answers. What is it that ever is? Space, the eternal um, anuparaka, or parentless. What is it that ever was? The germ and the root. What is it that is ever coming and going? The great breath. Then there are three eternals? No, the three are one. That which ever is, is one. That which ever was, is one. And that which is ever being and becoming is also one. And this is space. So again, here's the thing. <laughs> Do you really want to base your enlightenment on things like this? What is that that there ever was? The eternal parent. Um, or no, the eternal parentless. The germ and the root. The ever coming and ever going. The great breath. The three that are one. Is that, is that, is that what? No. So look, here, here, here's, here's the deal. The eternal parentless is us as eternal minds because we are eternal. We don't have parents. We are eternal. That's why they say parentless. Parentless means that it is created. We are uncreated. We are eternal by virtue of being zero and other, um, there are other reasons as well. Um, the germ and the root. Okay. So, so, so what, what is the germ and the root? Uh, this is the singularity that contains all potentiality within it that then actualizes. What that essentially means is that when you have mind in perfect alignment and it is net to zero, it exists as a singularity, which is basically nothingness, but that nothingness contains everything by virtue of zero being able to contain internal opposites. So you have this nothingness that contains everything, which is you have the singularity that is like the seed, but it has potential for birthing everything from it in uh, forming different combinations when it is no longer in perfect phase, when sinusoidal waves go out of phase, and then they have a non-zero space-time or a non-singularity space-time projection, difference now occurs, and you have difference. You have the domain of space and time, what we call the holos. And then the great breath. What is the great breath? That's the, that's the, that is the singularity expanding. This is the, the great breath, the expansion of the singularity, the seed, giving birth to the space-time universe. Um, and this is the three that is one because they're all the same thing. We are the parentless, the eternal monadic minds that contain the frequency information. We are that seed that contains all the frequency information and our <sighs> outbreath is the, uh, the data combining in asymmetrical ways to give rise to difference, which is the Big Bang and the Big, si big Bang singularity. Now, so do you see my point? This is much more precise and much more valuable, and you can do much more with this and have a lot more knowledge rather than talking about the parentless German, the root that breathes. Okay, so for clear understanding on the part of the general reader, it must be stated that the occult science recognizes seven cosmical elements, four entirely physical, and the fifth, ether, semi-material, as it will become visible in the air towards the end of the fourth round, 
to reign supreme over the others during the whole of the fifth. Like that's, no, that's not gonna happen. So the remaining two are as yet absolutely beyond the range of human perception. These latter will, however, appear as uh, presentiments during the sixth and seventh rounds, respectively. These seven elements with their numberless sub-elements, far more numerous than those known in science, are simply conditional modifications and aspects of the one and only element. The latter is not ether, nor even akasa, but the source of these. The fifth element, now advocated quite freely by science, is not the ether hypothesized by Isaac Newton, although he calls it by that name, having associated it in his mind probably with the ether, father-mother of antiquity. As Newton intuitively says, nature is a perfect circulatory worker generating fluids out of solids, fixed things out of uh, volatile and volatile out of fixed, subtle out of gross, and gross out of subtle. Thus, perhaps, may all things be originated from the ether. All right, so the ether was this idea that um, I believe it was, yeah, it was still around in the early 19th century, I think. Uh, I'm not, not early 20th century, the 1900s. I think um, that's when it was uh, because basically special relativity said, hey, there's no such thing as um, the ether. When, when, I, when um, the theory of relativity, Einstein, the ether was this idea that there was this sort of um, background substance which served as the absolute framework of existence to which everything else was relative to. It was the absolute reference frame, essentially. But anyway, through scientific experiments, they show that the ether does not exist, and science believes that there is no absolute reference frame, that everything is relative. So in Hyperionism, that is not true. The ether does exist, but it's not physical, all right? So there is no physical ether. The absolute reference frame is the domain of mind upon which everything else is formed. So everything in reality is generated from mind. It's a projection of mind. So that which everything is relative to is mind. Everything is relative to mind. Mind stands as the absolute reference frame. Science is very confused because they think that there is no reference frame and everything is relative, and this leads to all kinds of problems. Um, but that that's the kind of problems you get when you um, deny mind. They think that there is no absolute re reference frame and everything is relative because mind is the absolute reference frame, and they're like, well, where is it? We can't find it. It's literally the thing that you're using to look. They deny mind and they deny uh, they the mind they they deny the fundamental that mind is fundamental, and they remove mind from their models of reality, even though they are minds that are doing the calculations. Like, do you see how silly that is? They create models of reality that are purely material that don't have mind within its uh, fundamental conception. Yet they are minds doing this. And they're like, wow, this is very strange. We, <laughs> Why doesn't this quite work? It's because you have not incorporated yourself into the equation. You are in a, feed, you're in a system that's a feedback loop with itself, essentially. And, but you have removed yourself from it, even though you are the one that is doing the looking. It's just like, well, we can't find the absolute reference frame. Mind is the absolute reference frame. It's like trying to look at yourself. Uh, how, how, how do you say it? Um, it would be like, you know, uh, tr 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 trying to look at your own face if you didn't have a mirror, right? Like trying to trying to do that. And, and, and they're, ba you know, they, they're basically like, well, we can't find it when it's literally the thing that they are using to do the finding. That is what they're looking for, but they can't find it because it's not something they're going to discover. It is what they are. Um, so anyway, the ether. So this whole idea about like seven rounds and the fifth subtle ether, all this stuff, like this is why you have to be careful with esoteric stuff, because uh, this is not grounded in reason whatsoever. It's it's really just it's like that's the problem if you're going to be basing your ideas in, in occult and esoteric knowledge. Right, they're claiming that, okay, well, the latter will, however, be presented during the sixth and the seventh rounds, these cell elements with their numberless sub-elements, the latter, like, why? Why? Why are there seven rounds? How are there seven rounds? How does that work? Why does that occur? Why Why is it that this semi-material will become visible in the air towards the end of the fourth round to reign supreme over the others during the whole of the fifth? It's just pure statements. They're not giving any reasons as to why this could be. And that's, again, with Hyperionism... Everything is based on reason. 
So if we say such and such is the case, it, you're sure as hell going to bet that there's going to be a reason for why we are saying this. There's going to be an explanation. We're not just going to be like, oh, well, in the seventh round, the 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 super substance shall manifest as the ascended master Raphael, who will then bequeath uh, consciousness to all his fault. You know, any, anything that's that's in Hyperionism, we have a reason for why we are saying it, why it is thus and not otherwise, why there is an explanation for why. Um, um, and, and, and this is why, again, we're not esoteric, we're not a cult, we're not mystical, we're not secret societies. We are forward thinking based on logic and reason for the giving humanity the, uh, the optimal tools to reach a higher state of consciousness and telling humans that, oh, in the seventh round, the, 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 the super secret material is going to manifest. How is that helping? How is that helping them raise their consciousness? You're just, you're just giving them pure statements with nothing to back it up. How you help humanity raise their consciousness is by teaching them how to think effectively. You give them the tools. You don't do the thinking for them. You see, you don't go, hey, this is what's going to happen. In you know, this super, it, you're just, you're just replacing, that's just another religion. Why should they believe you? If they just believe, if you just, if you just tell people these certain things with absolutely nothing to back it up, you are not helping raise their consciousness in any way whatsoever. They're just dogma. They're just believing dogma. What you want to do is teach people how. That's why I say in Hyperionism, we teach inner star actualization, which is about integrating your unconscious into the con into consciousness. And it, tells you how to do this. It gives you the tools. It gives you the process. And it's like, okay, now go out and do it. Do the inner work. This is, we're, it's just, not, it's not about just making pure statements because that's just dogma. Right. Anyway, it, uh, so it is interesting to notice in this connection that Newton was familiar with the writings of, um, Jacob Bowman, the Teutonic theosopher, and that among Newton's posthumous papers were found copious notes and translations of his work. Yeah, and it is true. Newton was heavily involved involved in the occult, uh, but he was a terrible, terrible person. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at, I've studied Newton, but yeah, he yeah, because he was really into alchemy and 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 occult knowledge, but like this really toxic version of it, where I forget, but he was extremely sexually repressed. He had a lot of issues going on. He was very, um, uh, he was not a good person. Uh, I, I don't remember the details at the moment. It's been a while, um, but he was into alchemy and occult stuff, but not even the positive ones. He was into some like very like toxic, uh, uh, inhibiting anti-sexuality sorts of, sorts of ideas. So... Um, as to the races referred to in the above quotation, it need only be said in passing that the secret doctrine declares that in the evolution of humanity, there are to be seven races, of which ours is now the fifth, and that each race makes seven rounds on our planetary chain, of which rounds the present race is now in the fourth, with here and there a fifth round appearing. Okay, so why? I mean, that's cool. It's nice. I mean... Sounds like it'd make a good movie, but how do I how do I know that what you're telling me is true? How come there's seven races that make seven rounds and that we're on the fifth? Um, how 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 is this the case? So again, like in, in Hyperionism, we say that there are universal cycles, not not nothing to do with this, not seven rounds or whatnot. But we give a precise reason as to why there are seven universal cycles, and we show that mathematics of reality and that this is a system of, of evolving mathematics and as we optimize and become more evolved we're essentially optimizing our internal mathematical functions we are becoming more and more um optimized and it sounds very mechanical and i don't mean to make it sound like that just human words are very limited this is a system of living mathematics that comes with brilliant and beautiful experiences as we gain knowledge and have meaningful experiences and find love and and learn about the universe and learn about ourselves but while we're doing that what's happening on the mathematical side of things is that our inner pattern is optimizing so when you get to the old the highest pattern in which we are all evolving and synchronizing together as a monadic neural network, as a system of a uh, that sort of reflects the architecture of the brain, but but not in a physical way, and it has similarities to neural networks and computer science. 
um, again, not exactly the same, but it is a system, a monadic neural network. What happens is, is that when you um, have these, uh, you know, frequencies that we are composed of, like I said, when they are in perfect symmetry and perfect harmony, which reflects perfection, it results in nothing in space-time, just a singularity. So the reason why that there are universal cycles is because when we reach a state of perfection, the physical world must vanish, mathematically speaking. It has to. This is the laws of mathematics. This is how it, for, via Fourier transforms, when everything is in perfect alignment, there is no longer any difference. Space-time vanishes. There is only a Dirac delta function in the, in the space-time uh, centered at the origin. It's just a singularity. It's nothingness. Um, but it's the realm and domain of perfect mind. Now, that can only last for an instant because we also know that reality can um, never remain still. And I'm going to have to pause myself a little bit because this is something that would go into taking me so long to explain. And, and I want to just focus on this. But essentially, we know that motion is mandatory because rationally speaking, it, it necessarily must occur because there is nothing to prevent its occurrence as long as it traces out a pattern that results in zero uh, net because zero is nothingness. But essentially what, what this means is that since uh, motion occurs continuously and rationally and logically must always occur, that once a state of perfection is reached, that perfection cannot be maintained because it is on, there's only this one state of perfection. So once, you know, because of inherent motion, that perfection will break and asymmetry will occur. And this will give birth to space time again, because once you have this breaking of perfection, now the space time projection is no longer a Dirac Delta singularity. It is, there is difference and there is space time. So do you see the huge difference? I'm just trying, and, and I'm not even giving the full detailed explanation I, because I don't have the time, but do you see what I mean? Hyperionism, we're not like just like, oh, well, yeah. And then there's these universal cycles and they go through seven rounds and there's, you know, these seven races that we're currently on the fifth round, by the way. It's just dogma. If, you, if you're going to, if you're going to, I'm really trying hard not to be disparaging. I just, so the thing is I grew up in a Christian household for those who don't know. Um, I experienced religious trauma syndrome. I still have religious trauma syndrome to some degree. I've gotten over a lot of it, but it's still done a lot of damage. And so I am very adverse to dogma. I'm very adverse to, and, and I think that that's what this is. This is actually, it's stuff like this is, is triggering to RTS, religious trauma syndrome, which is a, a very big deal. Um, and stuff like this is triggering because it's all the religion is just pure dogma. It's like, oh, well, God created you and now you are sinful because Adam and Eve ate from the apple because they listened to the talking snake. And now you have to listen to the guy that got nailed to a tree and then was raised from the tomb in three days. Because if you are like that guy, then you don't have to burn in the hell pit for eternity. You know, you can all this is incredibly psychologically abusive, pure dogma with no reason behind it whatsoever. So even though there's good information and stuff like this, I don't like assertive dogma. It's triggering and it's upsetting because it keeps people in a state of subjugation and it places them in a container that does not allow them to raise their consciousness because you aren't giving them the tools to free, uh, think freely you're telling them what to think. So Hyperionism is not about telling you what to think. It's about giving you the tools so that you can think freely and understand how you can come to these conclusions on your own, through your own understanding. That's what it's all about. You're not going to raise your consciousness by just, oh yeah, okay, well the seven races and the and the, the fourth plane and the fifth, you know, I'm going to... You're, you're not going to raise... Your consciousness is not going to be raised because you've memorize some words in a book. Raising your consciousness is a process. When you come, when humans, you know, when self-awareness is arises by realizing that you are a distinct entity from the environment and it comes with a whole new range of experiences. You're not going to just, you know, tell a baby you can't, <laughs> you're self-aware. Did you know that? And go, Oh, wow. I didn't know that. It's a process that occurs when it evolves um, by, by, by virtue of that process. So 
you you can't just make someone reach a higher awareness. I'm snapping a lot today. I need to calm down with the snapping. You can't just make someone reach a hyper awareness or a higher awareness, but you can give them the tools so that they can get there themselves. Let's let's imagine that self awareness ar arises by looking at the ref at a reflection and realizing that oh hey that's me. Let's say that that's how self awareness. I'm not claiming that it does, but just for sake of argument, let's say that that how that's how it is. You can't make someone become self-aware. But what you can do is lead them over to the reflecting pool where they can see their reflection. And now they have the, the increase their, like you, you're, you're, you're giving them the tools necessary. They have to come to the understanding themselves. You can't make them recognize themselves in the reflection but you can lead them to the reflecting tool, give them the tools. So anyway, the secret doctrine apparently decrees that there are seven races of which we are the fifth and that each race makes seven rounds on our planetary change chain of which rounds the present race is now on the fourth. The secret doctrine teaches not only the immortality of the soul, but of the perfectibility of humanity by orderly evolution on this earth. And, and that's true. But I mean, you see how much more detail. Yes, we are eternal and we go through evolution on earth because we are monadic minds that are using these avatars as uh, essentially as, as, as functions to localize. Monadic minds are non-local. They exist in the frequency domain. Avatars, bodies, are space-time functions. Monadic minds uh, link to frequency, uh, as frequency functions, link to um, interact with space-time functions. And now this, as a monadic mind, gives you all the data of um, that your senses provide of the space-time domain. It's like putting on a VR headset. When you, as a monadic mind, link to an avatar, a body, you are suddenly, whoof, in this domain of space and time and lights and and you know people and, and objects and you have a specific location and you can walk over there instead of there. That's what an avatar allows you to do. And through this, you can learn and understand, and, wow, look at everything and, and have all the, and have experiences and gain knowledge and understanding through this. That's what avatars allow you to do when you localize in the space-time domain, the holos. And it, it's a lot like putting on a VR headset. You know, imagine that, that you put on a VR headset, then whew, automatically, wow, you're in this whole other world. And you can, you know, go over, you know, to this place and meet these other people and go on these quests and be in this whole virtual environment. But the whole time you're still sitting in one place, you're not actually going anywhere. And the whole place is just all in your mind, so to speak, right? Um, I mean, I know it's a screen, but you, you get what I'm saying. Same sort of thing is that you are a monadic mind, a system of, of frequency that exists in the non-local domain of the source. But linking to an avatar is like putting on that VR headset that feeds you information to give you the experience of a localized world, of a world where you can walk over there and talk to this person and have localized interactions. Uh, so anyway, I don't, why was I talking about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, because the secret doctrine not only talks about the immortality of the soul, but why is the soul, soul immortal? because it's equivalent to zero, and zero is mathematically equivalent to nothingness, and it contains all opposites within itself. Um, the doctrine concerns the general evolution, which the present work touches only incidentally. It is complicated and necessarily so. And also, the I'm, I'm sorry, but also the danger of this sort of thing and why I don't like dogmas, because if you're just blindly listening to stuff, like, oh yeah, there's seven races and the seven rounds and blah, blah, blah. What about when it comes to very important things like rights and laws? very important issues. Well, if you're so used to believing these authority figures with dogma, if they just say something like, oh yeah, um, you know, by the way, you have to sign over all your, I, I don't know, you know, you know what I mean? We're, we're going to make, we're going to make same, uh, we're going to make same sex marriage illegal. And you know why? Because that's the secret doctrine it says that same sex marriage is illegal because in the beginning, there was the great mother and the great father. And so inherently reality reflects male and female or something like that, right? And and if you're just used to believing dogma, oh, well, if the secret doctrine says that, I guess it's true. I mean, we don't want to miss the sixth round. Now, seeing the th thing with Hyperionism is that, yeah, we have ideas for 
how a new world should be. But just like we give explanations and reasons behind everything, we absolutely give explanations and reasons behind everything. And everything should be questioned for reasons. If we say, well, things should behave this way, ask why. Don't just blindly believe. Ask why. And if there's not a good reason for it, don't believe it. So it becomes very important, especially when one is trying to institute a new world, as we are in Hyperianism. We want to create this world together. We're not looking for, for, for slaves. We're not just going to be like, well, this is how wit's going to be because we decree it to be this way. And we're the holders of this. No, it's, it's, it's such that we want to create a better world based on these 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 principles that are well founded and well laid out so there are three fundamental pro propositions that underlie the secret doctrine a an omnipresent eternal boundless and immutable principle on which all speculation is impossible as it transcends the power of human conception well then you can't say anything about it you can't give it the properties of omnipresent eternal boundless and immutable because you just said that you cannot be speculated and it's beyond conception so um you can't give it, you, you have to, mm, can't say anything. You cannot, you cannot ascribe a property to it. You cannot ascribe a property to it. Because if you say um, it's infinite, then that means that it is not finite. So anyway, yeah, if you're going to say something is, is impossible to speculate about and beyond human conception, don't stop giving your properties. Uh, so anyway, this thing that apparently can't be speculated about is all these things. Um and could only be dwarfed by any human expression or similitude. It is beyond the range and reach of human thought. In the words of Mandukya, unthinkable and unspeakable. This infinite and eternal cause, dimly formulated in the unconscious and the unknowable of our current European philosophy, is the rootless root of all that was or all that ever shall be. We know exactly what this is. This is a principle of sufficient reason, and ontologically this is expressed as zero. It is everything and nothing, and this isn't a contradiction, because zero can contain everything within it as long as that everything is balanced. It's eternal by the properties of being zero, and it contains the possibility for all creation within it, because it contains literally everything that is possible within itself. In Sanskrit, it is sat. The benes is symbolized in the secret doctrine under two aspects. On the one hand, absolute... <laughs> it's, just, it's also funny to me that they just said it's unthinkable and unspeakable, yet... Yet let's let's continue talking about what about this unspeakable, unthinkable thing. On the one hand, absolute abstract space represented by bare subjectivity, the one thing which no human mind can either exclude from any conception or conceive of by itself. On the other hand, absolute abstract motion representing unconditioned consciousness. So I mean, it is it it, it is true that I don't know why they I don't know why they associate space with um, bare subjectivity because th that's just not right. But um, talking about, yeah, bare subjectivity and absolute abstract motion um, being eternal, uh, that that is true. Um, but but again, they're not giving reasons why. They're just sort of asserting it after they had just said that it's unspeakable, un unspeakable and cannot be conceived of. We, 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 anyway, spirit or consciousness and matter are, however, to be regarded not as... By the way, it's also illogical to say that knowledge is impossible. It's another thing that, you know, some people are like... Well, knowledge is impossible. Some people make this claim. Just so you know, if everyone, if anyone ever tells you that, like, well, knowledge is impossible, call them out on their bullshit because that's a knowledge statement. If you say that knowledge is impossible, you're making a knowledge claim. That knowledge claim being that knowledge is impossible. But you just said that knowledge is impossible. So you can't know that knowledge is not possible. So knowledge very well may be possible. Uh, anyway, on the other hand, absolute uh, blah, 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 blah. spirit or consciousness and matter are, however, to be regarded not as independent realities, but as the two aspects of the absolute. Yes. Which constitute the basis of conditioned being, uh, whether subjective or objective. Yes. Considering this metaphysical triad, the only reality, spirit and matter, as the root from which proceeds all manifesta manifestation, the great breath assumes the character of precosmic ideation. Plato's world of divine ideas, Plato's domain of forms. Uh, it is the fons est origo of force and of all individual consciousness and supplies the guiding intelligence in the vast scheme of cosmic evolution. On the other hand, pre-cosmic root substance, Mulapra Kriti, 
is that aspect of the absolute which underlies all the objective planes in nature. Uh, see, that's the thing, right? Do you really want to believe in the pre-cosmic root substance mula prakriti? Or do you want to understand the truth about mathematical sinusoids, sine, cosine waves, how they interact via Fourier transforms, very precise. You know, it's up to you. You, if you want, if you would like to, that's fine. I'm not saying don't. You are more than welcome to go believe in the secret doctrine that posits the precosmic root substance, mul palakriti. Go ahead. Go for it. It is that aspect of the absolute which underlies all the objective planes in nature. The second of the three spot postulates of the secret doctrine is the eternity of the universe in toto as a boundless plane, periodically the playground of numberless universes incessantly manifesting and disappearing, called the manifesting stars and the sparks of eternity. The eternity of the pilgrim, the monad, or self and man is like a wink of the eye of self-existence. The appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a regular tidal ebb of flux and reflux. So they're kind of, sort of, talking about cosmic cycles, except they're doing it in a really weird way where they're talking about... Um, the eternity of the universe as a boundless plane periodic... Yeah, so they're essentially talking about cosmic uh, cosmic cycles. The, the, the wording of it is... is a little, a little weird, but that's essentially what they're talking about. Um, and the third postulate is... Um, sorry, I was just... <laughs> never, never mind. I was just... Never mind. I, let's just continue. The fundamental identity of all... The third postulate is the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul, the latter being itself as an aspect of the unknown root and the obligatory pilgrimage of, for every soul, a spark of the former through the cycle of incarnation or necessity in accordance with cyclic and karmic law during the whole term. Okay. Well, so, okay. <laughs> Oh man, so much, so much to unpack here. So here's the problem. If you're talking about all souls in identity with a universal oversoul into which all souls are journeying towards, there's so much room for misinterpretation here. What one can interpret that as meaning as being like, oh, well, we're all individual souls, but there's this one big God soul that we all are, are, are wanting to, you know, attain or seek. That's a dangerous way someone could interpret this sort of thing. So the idea is we are all individual monadic minds. Considered together, we form a single network mind. But it's not anything apart from us. It's it's only there. Be, it's like a house and, and the bricks of a house. The house only exists because of the bricks. If you took all the bricks away, the house wouldn't be there. The house exists because of the bricks. The one network mind is us. It's what we are. This is what we call in Hyperionism, an aspect of hyper-awareness called the absolute perspective. There's the avatar perspective, monadic perspective, and absolute perspective. The absolute perspective is from that network consciousness. Now, um, we are not... Okay, it, oh man, it's just, I'm trying to say, like, how much time do I have? Um, does anyone do this anymore? Because watches aren't really a thing. I guess there are Apple watches, huh? Apple watch is a thing, so maybe people still do this. I don't know. Uh, okay, anyway, we're not all just one. There isn't an oversoul apart from us. We form one network mind. And we are differentiated by virtue of um, having unique, particularly, uh, particular patterns of, of frequency information. Uh, in philosophical terms, it is a universal that has particularized itself, and it has particularized itself by virtue of each one of us being a system of mathematics that can be arranged into different um, into different patterns. Both you and I can contain the same mathematical information, but arranged in different ways, thus giving us unique expressions and unique um, particular existences. Now. Um, there is a time where we can exist in absolute identity, which is at the omega point in which all of our contents become perfectly aligned and reflect every single one of us. And at that point, we are identical and can be thought of as one mind. But we are still a many in potential. 
So when one is identical, according to Leibniz's law, uh, which is a, there's a reason behind it. Um, it's not just a random law. Uh, Leibniz was the discoverer of calculus. Um, very intelligent individual, very, very intelligent individual. But um, anyway, according to Leibniz's law, uh, if, 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 if things have identical properties, then they can be thought of as the same thing, essentially. So at the, at the final point of the omega point, um, when space and time vanish and there is just the singularity, we collapse into perfect identity. And when we collapse into perfect identity, we can be thought of as one mind functionally because we are all identical and there is no way to differentiate until difference occurs. And then when difference occurs, it's like, oh, well, my pattern is now different from your pattern. And then we have unique instantiations of particularity. So we are all eternal. We will never stop existing. There are There is just a state when we are all identical and when it will seem as though we are one. And we will be one, except potentially many. And then when we are particularized, we exist as individuals, but always form that one network mind. And eventually, as we evolve, that network mind will begin to come online. And in fact, those who attain hyper-awareness are the consciousness of the absolute of that network mind. This network mind is a consciousness, but it's not a separate consciousness. It's an aggregate comp uh, consciousness. It is a resultant consciousness. And those who are hyper-aware have are no longer simply self-aware, but they have this absolute awareness where it is realized that I, we, us, who know it as such are the consciousness of, we have recognized ourselves in the reflecting pool of existence. Instead of looking in the mirror and going, oh, that's me, we have looked around at reality and realized this is me slash us. So, and also, there's no such thing as karma. The pain, I'm just saying, I, I, I don't have, I don't have time. I don't, there's no such thing as karma. Okay. Karma is a very dangerous concept. It's not rooted in rationality and it leads to very dangerous ideas such as that, um, uh, well, oh, someone's just getting what they deserved because they must've been a bad person in their, in their past life. When it comes to reincarnation in Hyperionism, we prefer localization and relocalization, not this like mystical reincarnation business. But when it comes to this, it is based on evolution. It is not based on morality or karma or anything of that nature. There is no rational basis for karma. And there is uh, a lot of negative repercussions of believing in karma. Uh, there is no embedded morale, uh, karmic moral, morale, moral or ethic karmically embedded in reality. There's no rational basis for this. There's no rational mechanism for how this could work. And it leads to uh, a lot of again, negative repercussions. Oh, that person just, you know, got raped. Well, they must have been a terrible person in their back. Mm, yeah, karma. No, karma is a very, very, very dangerous concept. Um, so the pivotal doctrine of the Eastern philosophy admits no privileges or special gifts in man, save those won by his own ego through personal effort and merit through a long series of metempsychosis and reincarnation. Every soul must work out its own salvation and take the kingdom of heaven by force. Salvation by faith and the uh, vicarious atonement were not taught as now interpreted by Jesus, nor are these doctrines taught in the exoteric scriptures. Yeah, so I like all this, right? So every every soul must work on its own salvation um, and, and take the kingdom of heaven by force. I mean, I don't really like to say, take it by force is kind of a weird way to put it. But basically what what this means is, you don't have to believe in Jesus and be saved to go to heaven. You can work out your own salvation. And they say, take the kingdom. Of, I, I just don't. We create the kingdom of heaven around us by making the world a better place. This world is just potential. Right now, it is, it's a terrible place because you have imbeciles running the world. When we, when, when um, those who are hyper aware, compassionate, caring, um, rational, and understanding, and we live in a, in a in a in a society that reflects a goal of creating a better life for every individual and the collective, thus we can have a have a, a world that is a beautiful experience. So. They are later and ignorant perversions of the original doctrines. So, yeah, I mean, I like this stuff. This is good. So, you know, it's a big step up from mainstream religion. That's for sure. In the early church, as in the secret doctrine, there was not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in every man. 
Yeah. This is um good. Good, good, good. And and th this is reflected in Gnosticism, uh, particularly in, in in the Gospel of Thomas, which I have checked out my playlist will, where Jesus talks about uh, you know, in parables saying like, if something like drink from my mouth, drink from my mouth and you will become like me or something like this, basically essentially saying that, um, we are one and the same. And when you come to this understanding, drink from my mouth, meaning understand the words that I'm saying, you will realize that y you have this potential in you and can become God and, and all this. So check out my playlist on that. Uh, so so that's good. I like this. Um, this is again, Gnosticism, Gospel of Thomas, this is all heretical gospels that are rejected from the Bible, banned by the church, burned, um, especially the Nicene Council, burned them all. Many videos on this I have on my channel, particularly the Gospel of Thomas for, the, for that. Uh, theologians first made a fetish of the impersonal omnipresent divinity and then tore the Christos from the heart of all humanity in order to deify Jesus that they might have a God-man peculiar... Uh, that's hard peculiarly, 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 that's a hard, peculiarly, their own. Uh, yeah, so essentially what they're saying, and and, and yeah, that, that instead of saying that everyone can be like Christ, as in become their own Christ and become their own savior, you had theologians rip everyone else's divinity away, and and and, and place it in this external deity of Jesus, that one must worship. And this is power self-projection. We talk about this in interstar actualization. When you have your own personal power, but then project it into someone else and then give your power away to something or someone else, whether it's a god in religion or a celebrity or a politician, power self-projection is how fascism arises because you have all these people who give up their power to the godlike, you know, dictator. And and they they feed on that and 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 rule because of this power self projection and and this is how religions start this is all that so I um, mean in interstar actualization you must we talk about integrating your own power your own fiery core making it yours and your own not projecting it and giving it away the one immutable principle or wait hold on all the hmm, all the ancient mysteries had the true doctrine. And the early Christians had it. Masonry, uncontaminated by the disciples of uh, Loyola, had and has it also. The one immutable principle referred to in the first proposition, A, is called in the Kabbalah, Ein Sof. The word Ein meaning nothing. This is not Jehovah or Adonai or the G-A-O-U. Once again, G-A-O-U in, in, in uh, Freemasonry is the god of Freemasonry called the great architect of the universe. So this is not Jehovah or Adonai um, or G-A-O-U, Great Architect of the Universe, for it is not itself creative, but the course of creation, the cause, like the, uh, uh, the causeless cause. Again, do you see how you, you'll get so much, so much more precision with Hyperionism? The, the, in Kabbalah, the Ein Sof, the Ein meaning nothing, which is the causeless cause. Again, this is the mathematical... Zero. Zero is not caused. You can't cause zero because zero itself is eternal because it's nothing. Nothing is not something you can create. Nothing is not something you can destroy. It is nothing. And ein, ein sof, ein, nothing. It is nothingness. But it is, so it is causeless. You can't cause nothing. You can't, you can't make nothing. It's nothing. It's the causeless. But it's the cause. It's the cause of everything. Because within it, it contains everything. All positive and negative values of mathematics. So it contains all the building blocks that is needed in potential to create everything. It's contained within it because it contains all positive and negative values. All positive and negative frequencies. All positive and negative energies. In perfect balance such that it is a singularity. The Fourier projection is a Dirac delta centered at the origin. Then once difference occurs... Then you have a space-time uh, projection, the holos, that gives rise to the Big Bang, this world of, of difference and multiplicity and, and locality. So once again, it's the, the, the cause, what they're talking about, the Ein Sof, the causeless cause, this is, this is the concept of zero. The Jewish creators, plural, are the Elohim, the principalities and powers. In this conception of divinity lies the secrets of the ineffable name, 
that is the nameless. The lost word is to the master who possesses it and knows how to pronounce it. What the logo so creative power is to the nameless. So this whole thing about in masonry, it's like, oh, we had to find the lost word of the master, the lost word of the master. This is this whole thing in Freemasonry about the, the, this is the, the like the key to everything that is the, the word that created reality. The ineffable name, the nameless, the lost word of the master, those who possess it know how to, you know, knows how to pronounce it. Uh, you, you know, you get all this power and everything if you just find the lost word of the master, the word of creation, the ineffable name, the nameless. This is zero. Zero is is, is nameless. It's, it's a mathematical concept. You can't speak it in human language. It's a mathematical concept. It, we can call label it zero, but that's not to be accurate to what it actually is. It's a nameless thing. It's a mathematical concept. It's not really, uh, it's not it's not human language. It's mathematics. Mathematics is eternal and separate from human language. Human is, human language is a contingent um, idea. And so when you discover this lost word of the master, the ineffable name, this causeless cause, the Ein Sof, which is zero. Um, yeah, you become, you understand, you 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 understand the the power of creation and 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 what you are. If you understand zero completely and everything it implies, you understand what you are because you are you you as a monadic mind are also zero because you contain all mathematics within yourself. So there's a multiplicity of zeros, which is perfectly fine logically and rationally because zero plus zero plus zero plus zero is still zero. There's no violation of um, it's still nothingness. So you can have a multiplicity of zero all all monadic minds. Um. Uh, so, so the ineffable name, the lost word, the master possesses it, knows the creative power, hence the real master creates. And in this sense is a God. Yeah, we are all gods. And when, when we have full and complete, complete control over the lost word of the master or zero, that's us, that's ourselves having complete control over our mathematical data. And we can create whatever we so will. Eventually we will be able to create our own collective frequency domain, which is essentially like a collective dream world, which we will achieve planetary independence, no longer have to be uh, associated with this planet, um, and we can, and and we will no longer have to rely on the so-called physical domain of the holos because we will have, um, com, you know, control essentially over our own data, our own uh, frequency patterns, and be able to create collective frequency domain, a collective dream dream world, more or less. Um, we can call it that. Uh, it's a it's a mathematical domain, though. Always remember that. So, um, and and see again, it's just really funny because like. The whole thing in, in in Freemasonry is finding the lost word of the master. What's the lost word of the master? We once had it, but it was lost. What was it? What is it? And yeah, we once had it and it was lost because at the end of a cosmic cycle, you you have a memory wipe because you 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 fall into complete and total identity. And um, I don't want to get into the I, the whole explanation of why there's a memory wipe. It would just take so long to explain it, but it's essentially because we have completed existence and so we sort of wipe the slate clean so we can do it again um or else we would be stuck in sort of um in, in eternal hell if we didn't because we would be isolated as um singularly and completely um alone and we don't want to do that we want to experience ourselves in multiplicity again so we go through this mem memory wipe the lost word of the master the name that we once had that, that created everything was now lost um, and then the whole thing in masonry is like, oh man, we got to find this. What is this? And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's this, this concept that, that we're talking about zero. It's the idea. And, and I, and I'm, and I'm saying zero as short of shorthand. It is very complicated. It, it's just that, um, it's all the, it's the structure of existence and how it operates, but ultimately it all resolves to zero. And the reason why that zero is so important is because it's just a way to show that reality is reflects the principle of sufficient reason, total and perfect reason, because it's total and perfect balance. You don't have any, now that balance can be rearranged, but it doesn't matter how you arrange it. It'll still be zero. Cause if you know, imagine, imagine that zero is a box and it contains all the numbers where it's your negative and positive. Ultimately that box, since it contains all negative and positive numbers, it's going to equal zero, but you can rearrange those numbers in that box all you want. You can form different patterns, but the total result is, so, is still zero. So you can have this perfect zero, but have these um, different patterns within it. And this is how we have a world of multiplicity and difference and, and unique patterns while still maintaining an overall uh, balance. So anyway, yeah, the, 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 we, if you want the lost word of the master, there it is. In the second proposition, the eternity of the universe in total reveals the law of cycles and the in incessant work of creation. In other words, the creative process never had a beginning and will uh, never have an end. Yes, that's true. This is one endless succession of universes. Yes, that's true. You see the difference, though. This is, 
this is just pure assertion without giving reasons why. And while this part is true, what about the part where they were talking about like seven races and the four rounds and the so you got to be careful. Like yes, this start is, stuff is true, but it's still just do, even though it is true, it's just dogma, and you have to be careful because you can slip in some very dangerous ideas in there. Uh, worlds and solar systems continually appear and disappear. Each sun, star, or solar system has a period of activity and a period of repose, emanates from and is drawn back into the all and the one. Yes, that's what we talked about. All, the entire universe, though, not just like a particular solar system or something. The, the entire universe. Uh, these periods are called the nights and days of Brahm. Yeah, in, in Hinduism, they, they talk about this. But again, it's all like myths and stories. Like, oh, uh, uh, Brahma, Brahman, um, uh, you know, has cycles of days and nights, sleepfulness and awakefulness. And it's true. We, as the absolute, come to consciousness of what we are. This is what hyper-awareness is, realizing it. And then periods of, of, of unconscious. And, and yeah, but it has to be not just pure dogma and mythology. The idea that a god with human qualities and human passions made the earth out of nothing is six days... In six days of 24 hours each is sufficiently miraculous and sufficiently childish for those who are ready to burn all who do not accept their interpretation. Yeah, so that's true. So he's saying the crazy idea that's taught in Christianity today that a god that's like a human and has like human passions and, and, and gets mad and angry created earth out of nothing in six days. Um, basically saying it's crazy and childish and it's insane that people are ready to burn individuals who don't accept this interpretation. Yeah, that's crazy. And I, I agree with this as all. So despite all my critique, this is loads better than mainstream religion, 100%. So to endow a god with the power of performing the impossible and the inconceivable was considered sufficient honor bestowed. The law of uh, periodicity is a necessary co uh, corollary of the order of events and the flight of time. Rhythmically, orderly, harmoniously, harmonious movements in space give us our conception of time as how fast, how often, how slow, how regularly, how regular. The ear is a time organ, and the basic property of the ether is sound. Uh... No. The idea of periodicity or law of cycles is symbolized is symbolized in Freemasonry in many ways. In the three, five, or seven years of pilgrimage or penance, in the seven years of plenty and seven of famine. Um uh, again. So in the low 12 and the high 12 and in calling the craft from labor to refreshment and many others, in the third postulate, we have the fundamental identity of all souls with the one, which gives the basis of eternal and universal brotherhood of man and the basis of the entire scheme of human evolution. When these doctrines are clearly understood, they will seem to go far beyond any modern scheme of evolution, though running on somewhat similar lines in them, the entire scheme of cosmic and human evolution will be found to have been worked out ages ago. Pythagoras and Plato found out these doctrines completely unfolded in the mysteries. Uh, oh, they found they founded these doctrines completely unfolded in the mysteries. Brother Pike says repeatedly that they have been far often uh, disfigured than apprehended and never transcended in modern times. Uh, Plato and Pythagoras are, are very important. Pythagoras understood, said all is number, number rules the universe, so he understood that reality was mathematical. Uh, Plato is important because he understood that um, reality is uh, based on a domain of, of, of like perfect forms and blueprints and that the physical world is just a shadow of that perfect world. And this all ties together. Reality is mathematical and space-time is a mathematic projection of, of frequency information, a Fourier projection. So you have, yeah, very much like a shadow, very, very close to the idea in, in essence of a shadow. But we want to, we want to make these ideas better. We want to not, we don't want to just like be content with listening to Pythagoras and Plato. We want to make all these ideas precisely defined and uh, beyond, we want to go to the future, not backwards. Um... Masonry derives its genius, its inspiration, its glyphs, and its traditions from this philosophy as taught in the mysteries. How short-sighted and time-serving, then, must it be for masonry to allow its grand traditions, its priceless inheritance, to be dwarfed and overlaid by illogical interpretations? 
Derived from records that were in the beginning and before being transfigured or disfigured by ignorance or cupidity, only an allegory of the true doctrines prepared by those who knew for the ignorant masses who demanded a sign and could never rise above a fetish. Yeah, so basically all the mainstream religions are just an allegory made by initiates who knew, like hit it, for ignorant masses who demanded a sign. And um, this is like a bartering a magnificent diamond for a lump of common clay. Shall Masons now complete the folly by trying to convince themselves and others that the clay is the only diamond? So, I mean, I got to say that, again, all my criticisms, I do like this, the, the author, and that I, I think his heart's in the right place, and I think he wants to teach people, and I think he wants people to understand, and, and he, you know, so I think, I think it's much better than mainstream religion, and this particular individual, I think, has his heart in the right place. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments about modern masonry, but again, you're not, you're not going to find anything in there that you're not going to find in Hyperionism, except infinitely more fleshed out and, um, you know, while, while, while you're out there looking for the lost word of the master, we're busy <laughs> using it. Uh, how much one's idea of God colors all his thoughts and deeds is seldom realized. The ordinary crude and ignorant conception of a personal God more often results in slavish fear on the one hand and atheism on the other. It is what Carlyle calls an absentee God doing nothing since the six days of creation, but sitting on the outside and seeing it go. The idea of God carries with it, of course, the idea of creation as something already completed in time, when the fact is that creation is a process without beginning or end. The world, all worlds, are being created today as much as they are at any point in the past. This is true, I mean, um, because we are in a world of constant motion, constant change. Heraclitus's um, river that is in constant motion, the fiery motion of Heraclitus, the only thing that does not change is the laws that govern the change and make the change possible. So the principles of reason themselves, but all the contingent formations that reason allows, those are always changing because motion is necessarily uh, is necessary. So emanating from the bosom of the all and running their cyclic course, day alternating with night on the outer physical plane, they are again indrawn to the invisible plane only to emerge after a longer night and to start again on a higher cycle of evolution. Uh, they're, they're talking about universal cycles again. Theologians have tried in vain to attach the idea of imminence to that of personality and ended in a jargon of words and utter confusion of ideas. A personal absolute is not a uh, except in potency. God does not think, but is the cause of thought. God does not love. He is love in the perfect or absolute sense. And so with all the divine attributes, God is thus concealed, is the concealed logos, the causeless cause, the rootless root. God never manifests himself to be seen of men. Creation is his manifestation. And as creation is not complete and never will be, as it never had a beginning, there is a concealed or unrevealed potency back and beyond all creation, which is still God. Now, when you're talking about this here, like, what I don't like about this language is that one can still interpret this as thinking that there is a God outside of us doing all these things. It's a different idea of God, but one could still think of it as somehow being different from us. It's not, we are, I don't even like using the word God, that's why I say absolute. We are, this is what we are. This is us. We are the ones that created all this. We are the causeless cause. We simply forgot we, because of uh, the, the memory wipe at the Omega point. Um, so the, 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 the journey of existence is the rediscovery of ourselves and our divinity. Know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods, because that's what you are. Now, space is the most perfect symbol of the idea of divinity. They're really obsessed with space. And then space is a very like external thing. What is true is internal. We, uh, if you want to think of a, of a mental space, but this is what we call a frequency domain. Um, so any for for enter for it enters into all our concepts and is the basis of all our experiences. Uh, they have a very weird definition of space. We cannot fathom it or define it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can or exclude it from a single thought or experience. I, I mean, yeah, you can. Space is boundless, infinite, unfathomable, unknowable, in all, overall, through all. We know that it is, and all, and this is all we know about it. it seems like they're just talking about existence, really. Not not. It's odd that they're calling it space. But are not these just the attributes that are assigned to the absolute and infinite deity? And they are all negations. God says the Kabbalah, oh God says the Kabbalah, is no thing. 
again, we're talking about the concept of, of zero and, and perfection, um, ma mathematical perfection in the form of reason. But the theologian will hasten to say that this is pure pantheism. It is no more pantheism than it is atheism, for as already shown, the Ein Sof, nothing, is before and beyond creation or cosmos. Yeah, that's true. I already explained this. It is not God deduced or derived from nature, but precisely the reverse, nature derived from God. Yes, true. Nature comes from us as the uh, causeless cause. We are God. We are the absolute. And yet God, us, remains the same yesterday, today, and forever, the changeless. The changeless aspect is the point that is, say, zero. Zero is always zero, despite how um, everything changes. So you can have change and chainlessness um, kind of in, uh, that, that exist together, and it's not a contradiction because you can have something that is zero, but since it contains all values, those values can arrange themselves in different ways and can constantly be in change and constantly be in flux while maintaining a net result of changeless zero. So that's not, so that is not a logical contradiction. Just to be clear, this does not violate region, reason. It's not a logical contradiction. Even though in our imperfect human language, it sounds like it. Oh, reality is both changeless and changing eternally. It sounds like a contradiction due to our limited human language, but it is not when one understands mathematically zero is equal to all things. The zero aspect is changeless. The all things aspect can be arranged in different patterns while maintaining a net result of zero. So it's not a violation of reason. It's not a violation of mathematics. It's not a violation or a logical contradiction or a rational contradiction. It's just um, human language that makes it seem like that. So the stability of nature is derived from the unchange uh, unchangeableness of God. God never tires, is not exhausted at his work, needing rest. See, I still don't like all this shit. Like, you could still be, someone could still very well be thinking of God as something outside of them in this language. And also talking about God not tiring or being exhausted or not needing rest. It's very confusing. Just talk about it, it, it precisely. Um, not, not with all these confusion, conf confusing metaphors. Uh, that were so human as to be children and the ideas perhaps originated from the cyclic law and the Kabbalah of the days and nights of Brahma, Brahman. Um, the Manvataras and Pralayas, or uh, periods of outbreathing and inbreathing in the cycles of evolution. So you, you have this in Hinduism, the outbreathing and the inbreathing, the days and nights of Brahman, um, all these different uh, concepts here. Hold on one moment. One second. Uh, hold on, I lost my book. Where did you go? Oh, here we go. So, um, yeah, hence the parable given to the ignorant of the praying of God's working and then resting. Yeah. So if the reader will but reflect a moment on his own process of breathing, do it right now. He will find that the in-breathing and the out-breathing are equal... <laughs> And equally active processes, uh, although so different, each being the opposite of each other, each in turn the cause of the other. Stop one and the other ceases also. The more one, ref <laughs> sorry, uh, the more one reflects on the symbol of the great breath, which creation is, the more he will understand of both eternal nature and his own being. But it may be asked, is man to be deprived of all the idea of personality except his own? By no means. God is the author of being. Wait, let me just hold on. But it may be asked, is a man to be deprived of all idea of personality uh, except his own? By no means. God is the author of being, is the author of personality. He personifies himself, expresses the potency of himself, which personality is, through man. The hand of provid providence is always a human hand. Humanity is both the vehicle and the agent of what man has called the providence of God. So it's still like they're kind of getting closer to saying, but they're not equating humanity with God at this point. They're basically saying that humanity is the instrument and expression of God. And that's still not clear. People can still be like, oh, I am the instrument and vehicle of God. You are the instrument and vehicle of yourself. You are God using your own creation as the vehicle and expression of yourself to experience yourself. As we experience each other, we're experiencing ourselves together. Like, hi, how are you? You are me, I am you. 
as Hegel says, this is, it is the I that is we and the we that is I. Uh, hum, um, humanity in total then is the only personal God. Okay, well, that's that's good. Humanity in total then is the only personal God. It's still not as clear as I would like it to be. I still think most people without a guide would understand this. Um, and Christos is the realization. The Christ is the realization or perfection of this divine persona and individual conscious experience. So they are more or less saying this that humanity is the only personal God and Christ is the realization or perfection of the divine persona in individual conscious experience. So they are, you know, more or less saying this. Still, the, the, the clarity, you know, the use of like parables and metaphors leads, leads to lots of misunderstanding. But, it, you know, th th it is what, this is what they mean. And that, that is good. That is good, you know? So when this perfection is realized... Well, come back. When this perfection is realized, the state is called Christos with the Greeks and Buddha with the Hindus. Hence, the Christ is at one with the Father. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I still don't like these, these Christian metaphors and allegories because I think it can be still be misinterpreted. But their, their point, what they're trying to get across is, is good, that... That, that what Christ is, is what you can achieve when you are one with the Father, meaning that you realize your divinity through attaining Christ, which is the perfection of your individual consciousness. But you see what I'm like, it's very, do you see where people can, if they're not careful, like there's a lot of ways people can trip and fall and get the wrong idea. So humanity in total, what is it? Is it the generation of the present age or any age in the past or of the future and the, uh, these alone? Justice rules the universe as in, and is the foundation of all law. Justice is the kingdom, the permanency of deity. Humanity therefore means every human being um, humanity therefore means every human being ever born in any age or to be born in the coming ages on this planet. All are in the hollow of his hand, one God, one law for all, else there is no justice. And if it shall be done unto each according to deeds done in the body. By the way, there's still it's also very male-oriented. He, God is he, brotherhood, man, justice. Uh, Hyperionism absolutely incorporates um, <laughs> not definitely not this this sort of patriarchal gender bias. Uh Freemasonry has been um, pretty, pretty, pretty sexist and, and segregated men and women. And um, in the past, the women were not taught the mysteries, but were more relegated to things like fundraisers and putting together dinner parties and things like that. Um, but anyway, in Hyperionism, we synthesize. So our ethic is not an ethic of justice. Our ethic is a teleological ethic that synthesizes justice and care. So justice. Um, Oh man, I'm I'm not gonna get into this. It's take too long. Anyway, long story short, in addition to justice, we need care. Uh, care is a very important element and has been disregarded and trampled underfoot by a patriarchal society, and the world is suffering its consequences as we see the lack of care all around us. So this is very patriarchal. He, the one God, one law for all, for justice. And it shall be done unto each according to the deeds done in the body. For if a man soweth, so shall he reap. The only logical deduction is law governing action and determining result according to absolute justice. Very patriarchal here. <clears throat> and this is the Kabbalah, the secret doctrine and masonry and all sacred. Oh, and this, the Kabbalah, the secret doctrine and masonry and all sacred books and all religions everywhere teach. By taking the symbols for the thing symbolized, men have been made contradictions out of details and then built up a system of final rewards and punishments attaching to acts in time and claimed their unreason and injustice as binding to all eternity. The result is atheism and materialism, for there is an instinct in man as part of his divine inheritance, and that instinct is an innate sense of justice. Destroy this, and the result is atheism, pure and simple. Destruction of the sense of justice has honeycombed the churches and has been uh, the parent of modern materialism. 
it is true that, you know what? Let me see how long this chapter is because I've been going on for a while. And if it's much longer, we may have to split this in two parts, but let me see. Oh my, oh my, oh my. So let, let me just see what we have going on here. What, what page was I on? Uh, let me see. So we have just, it's more discussing the secret doctrine. And then we get to a new section about the science and religion. Let me see. Okay. What are we at here? This is about what? Like five pages? Five, six. Let, let me see if we can get through this quickly. Because I would like to finish this chapter. Let's see if we can. If I can do so without being so distracted. But these, oh, there's so much to say. Let's see. Let's see if I can. Um, if not, we might have to split this, but I would like to be able to do the, the next section next week. If you guys want to see that, by the way, if you guys want to see the next section next week, tell me in the comments, not because I'm live right now. So not just the live chat, but in the replay, because I know that you are watching the replay. So if you're watching the replay, tell me in the actual comments, if you want to see this continued. Um, so let's see if we can get through this kind of quick here. The issue is not logically between an unjust God and no God, but between a God that is inconceivable because unjust and a God that is inconceivable because just, and therefore the issue of the supreme reason. But this philosophical concept of divinity has another still wider bearing. It concerns not only man's personal life, but determines his relation to his fellow men. It's the basics of ethics and furthermore coordination in his experience and all his knowledge. And this leads to true wisdom. To know God is the supreme wisdom. So God damn, I got to change that, that, that thing. So basically, um, they're, they're basically continuing here, talking about justice and the brotherhood of man and the great republic, the idea of the universal doc brotherhood, which was a cardinal doctrine in the ancient mysteries as it is involved in the first postulate of the secret doctrine. See, I don't like all this uh, patriarchal um, shit. I mean, let's call it for what it is. Pa patri patriarchy shit is, is patriarchal shit. So, um, the principle of justice is the law universal, and this principle of brotherhood and the perfectibility of man's nature through evolution necessitates reincarnation, but not simply justice. There is also care. The 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 complement or the antithesis of justice is care, which is synthesized into the Hyperion teleological ethic, um, which is not patriarchal, I'll tell you that much. Um, hence, the doctrine of pre-existence taught in all mysteries applies to every child of woman born. All conditions in each life being determined by previous living. This will be further, early, uh, further elaborated in another section of this book. Uh, thus, the father, the fatherhood of God in the personification of divinity in human in humanity includes the universal and unqualified brotherhood of man. Oh my God! There's just like you can just picture the penises um, being stroked right now. Oh, the fatherhood of God personified in the universal and unqualified brotherhood of Man, the real masters in all ages, knowing this from the lessons taught in the mysteries of initiations, have ever been the foes of autocrats, oligarchies, and oppression of every form. Which is really funny because um, a lot of oligarchs are masons these days. Uh, but it is true, however... So I'm just kind of skipping ahead because we want to get through this. And it's just a lot of same sort of thing. Brotherhood, jealous monarch in the church state... Um, it is true, however, that all masters or adepts may not be equally enlightened. That's right, that's true. Uh, there are different levels. Da, da, da. Basically talking more about, you know, how people destroyed the real knowledge and, and um, believed in, you know, the outer world, outer knowledge. And it seems the oppression still practiced in the name of religion. Men shot in a Christian jail in Christian Italy for reading the Christian Bible and almost every Christian state laws forbid 
forbidding freedom of speech on matters relating to Christianity and the gallows reaching its arms over the pulpit. And what's really interesting about this is, all right, like, like Freemasonry is very much opposed to like the actual, actual Christianity. It uses Gnostic Christianity, but, um, and, and America was founded by, by Freemasons, essentially not everyone, but was very much founded on Freemasonry. I mean, for fuck's sake, look at your dollar bills. Freemasonic images are everywhere. And so separation of church and state was very, very um, important. Um, so America was not founded on Christian values. America was more founded on Masonic values, um, which, according to mainstream Christianity, would be anti-Christian. If you want to know more about that, uh, watch my video called... Um, the Statue of Liberty is Lucifer, or Lucifer is the Statue of Liberty. Check that out as I talk about Masonic influences on, um, on there. So basically, they're, they're just continuing to talk about, you know, how Christianity burned and tortured people. Um, Masonry does not preach a new religion, it but reiterates the new commandment announced by Jesus, which was also announced by every great reformer of religion since history began. Drop the theological barnacles from the religion of Jesus as taught by him and by the Essenes and the Gnostics of the first century, and it becomes Masonry. So basically, you know, if you they're saying if you if you if you take Christianity as the Gnostics believed it, that's Masonry. Which is really if you know if you're not familiar with Gnosticism, they teach that the God of the Bible is Satan and that they imprisoned uh, humans on earth, uh, divine souls in material bodies. So Gnosticism would basically be considered like the Christians hate Gnosticism because it, it says that the God of the Bible is evil and satanic. So yeah, just to be clear, um, Masonry is being compared to, uh, you know, if you drop the theological barnacles, in religion taught as by the Essenes and the Gnostics, it becomes Masonry. So it's this Gnostic idea. Masonry in its purity, derived as it is from the old Hebrew Kabbalah as part of the great universal wisdom religion of remote antiquity, stands squarely for the unqualified and universal brotherhood of man in all time and in every age. To Christianize Masonry or to narrow it to the sectarian bounds of any creed is not only to dwarf and belittle it, but it must also inevitably result as among warring sects has always been resulted, has always resulted with religions in setting brother against brother and lodge against lodge and result in final dissolution. This is one of the plainest meanings of the legend of the lost word. The thinnest veil over the sublime mystery of the ineffable name is brotherhood and love. This is the light of the Logos. The gross darkness that hangs in a black veil over the Shekinah is selfishness, selfishness and hate. Even so hath it ever been, and so will it ever be, till brotherly love, relief, and truth reigns universally in the hearts of all humanity. The refinements of the so-called civilizations do not change the essential nature of man. Beneath all these, there sleeps or wakes a demon or an angel, and one of these is ever in chains, for no man can serve two masters. Yeah, and anyway, just to be clear, we're all, we're all about synthesizing our darkness and light into a higher uh, modality. So we are neither light nor dark. We are neither angel nor demon. We are synthesized and higher beyond these concepts. We incorporate, uh, we go beyond good and evil. We, uh, it is the Nietzschean ethic of beyond good and evil. Not exactly the Nietzschean ethic, but it has that in spirit, um, certain aspects of it where we're dialectically synthesized and don't deny our shadows, but rather incorporate our shadows to become whole and complete beings rather than flat fractured beings, whole and complete beings of both shadow and light synthesized according to reason. So that is the end of that section. The next section is about their secret doctrine regarding science and religion. And it's, it's pretty interesting. So what I want you to do is tell me in the comments, um, if in the replay, uh, if you're watching this, tell me in the comments, if you want to continue this book, let me know and we will continue this. I will have a playlist of it popping up here because we've done at least two so far, but by the time you're seeing this, there may very well be much more. Watch my previous video on this about the secret version 
version of Christianity where we talk, where they reveal, you know, like talks about Gnosticism and all the different bishops that talk about this hidden version of Christianity. Um, and yeah, let me know what, uh, what you think. Uh, there is a lot. We went over so much in this video, but tell me what you think. And if you enjoy my work, consider supporting on Patreon. Uh, when you support on Patreon, it helps out a lot. Um, the, uh, it'll pop up right over here, the link to where you can support and it allows me to create. And if you feel like you've ever gotten something from my videos, if you feel like you've ever learned something from my videos, uh, please consider supporting. It, it helps out a lot. That's, you know, how I'm able to create, the more support I get, the, the more, um, I'm able to make better creations and also puts a roof over my head and, and all that sort of thing. So I appreciate it very much. Shout out to everyone who supports, especially Renaissance Fairy, Trent, Cassidy, Michael, Angela, Maria, High Expectations Counseling, Jordy, and Svetlin. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. The link will pop up right over here and you'll get access to our weekly secret live streams and hidden discord server, the Citadel. Thank you.